Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today for this Tech Tuesday on tips and best practices for managing net backup storage lifecycle policies. Paul Weaver, Senior Systems Engineer, will be presenting today. We have all lines muted, but we'd like to make this interactive, so please send questions using the Q&A or chat features and they'll be addressed at the end of the session. And if you could, if using the chat feature, send it to all panelists or all attendees, that way we can all see them. Uh, the subcast is being recorded and will be posted out on our website for future viewing, so please, uh, please take a look at that. And I will now turn this over to Paul. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Paul Weaver. Uh, I'm a uh, senior systems engineer here at Datalink with our one call team. And today we are going to be uh, talking a little bit about the net backup lifecycle policies. Uh, I've tried to con uh, dense everything. Um, regarding this into uh, hopefully about a four-hour presentation. Um, um, no, sorry, one hour. Uh, but really, there is a lot more uh, to storage lifecycle policies than we're going to be able to cover today. Uh, so hopefully with the information that you have today and uh, some of the links that we'll be sharing throughout the presentation, um, you will be able to uh, definitely dive into it more uh, as your schedule permits. Uh, so let's get started. Usually when I've been in school, I've wanted to know um, before a class starts uh, what we're going to be learning, because if I can't know the objectives, it's hard for me to, uh, to gauge what to get out of it or, or what's ex expected. So these are the questions that we will be answering today. Uh, what is an SLP? How do you configure it? What are the best practices and what kind of things do you need to do for day-to-day -day management? Uh, is there any kind of reporting that you can do? Uh, and what about tuning? And uh, as we all know, this is an awesome piece of software, but uh, what do I need to do if we need to perform any maintenance or troubleshooting? Uh, so let's get started. Uh, okay, essentially, a storage lifecycle policy is uh, steps for automating your company's plan for managing a set of copies of your backups on disk and or tape. Uh, now, storage lifecycles can do duplications or replications, and we'll get more into that in a few minutes, but it can either be local or it can do it remotely, uh, which is uh, what NetBackup terms their error feature. Uh, and, and with this diagram, you can kind of see that there are three different sites that can all be managed uh, with SLPs to control um, where those images go. And uh, let's dive in. Uh, first of all, let's talk about what SLPs are. Uh, what is it? What is a storage lifecycle policy? And an, an SLP is a plan that is applied uh, to a backup policy or a schedule about how you want to control the life cycle of your backup image. Uh, it is a plan, and as we'll talk about uh, in a bit, we need to have a plan, or you need to have a plan of what you want to do. You just don't want to haphazardly uh, go through this. Uh, storage life cycle policy tells net backup how many copies of each backup image is needed, and where do you want to keep them? Do you want to keep them on disk and tape or tape or what. Um, a storage lifecycle policy also implements the, uh, the retention level for each desired copy. So as you'll see as we go through, uh, you can have a copy on disk have a retention of, say, one week, and a copy on tape have a retention of one year, um, or a remote copy have a retention of three months. And, and again, this goes back to match your plan for the data and what your requirements are. Storage lifecycle policies also make sure that um, an image cannot be expired until that plan has been fulfilled. Uh, that backup just, it won't let you do it. It'll tell you you can't do it until either the plan has been fulfilled or it has been canceled. And also when using the replication director option, uh, you can also manage storage array snapshots. We won't get into that too much in here, but you will see, I believe, in the coming slides that uh, as a, for an operation, you can tell it to um, 
perform a snapshot on your storage array when using the replication director feature. And as we talked about what it is a storage lifecycle policy, this is also what it's not. Um, storage lifecycle policies do not completely replace the net backup vault option in that it will not eject tapes from your tape library or keep the reports that come with uh, the net backup vault option. It does not do any kind of forecasting or monitoring, though there is reporting. Um, there is right now a limited uh, amount of information. As, as you'll see, it's, we can tell what's going on, but as far as forecasting is when you're going to run out of disk space and whatnot, there are features within OpCenter, but not within, per se, the storage lifecycle policy itself. And, of course, storage lifecycle policy, it's not a way to buy the drinks or snacks that you're thinking about consuming uh, during this presentation. Um, so to get started, you know, how do we configure storage lifecycle policies in NetBackup? Uh, in the admin console, there is a section under storage for storage lifecycle policies. You can see on this screen um, that there are actually two nodes under the storage section called uh, Storage Lifecycle Policies and SLP Windows. And these two uh, are your primary ways through the GUI for managing and configuring SLPs. When you go to create a new SLP, I'm not going to go into the details of uh, what menu options you can do, but you can either right mouse click, select new, um, or your other options available through the GUI to create a new SLP. But when you do, uh, you'll bring up a form like this, except that it will be blank. And this kind of gives you a sample layout of what an SLP will look like and the steps that um, are involved. Uh, you can see that this particular SLP has uh, one backup option. That means it will create uh, only one copy when doing the backup. Uh, actually, let me step back because the bottom step is also a backup. Step. So this policy is doing an inline duplication. Now with inline duplications, it all has to be done on the same media server. You can't have a separate media server for each backup step. Um, but regarding the first backup step, that you can see that one is going to a disk storage unit. And after that disk storage unit copy has been created, then it goes into duplication. And you can have one or more duplications based upon the number of copies that you want and where you want them. Again, this is implementing the plan that you hopefully have already created uh, to protect your backup data. And you can also see there's a replication window here. Uh, also, parts of the lifecycle policy at the top are data classifications and priorities. We'll talk about priority a little bit more uh, in the coming slide. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about the data classification, but that's the same as in a regular policy. Um, so what options can you have within an SLP? Uh, operations that you can do are backup, duplication, replication, snapshot, or import. Um, now, the first four options will be on the source side, <clears throat> your media server that is performing the backup step or a snapshot step. Uh, the import will be if you're doing a, a remote duplication uh, using the air feature of um, net backup. And then you can also have, as we talked in the slide before, multiple backup operations. And again, this is termed inline tape duplication. And uh, duplications or replications operations uh, have to have a source. And you can tell by the indentation um, in that bottom uh, screenshot that the duplication is using the top backup step, which is on disk, as its source. Um, and that does matter. Uh, you don't want to accidentally be um, using a copy sent to tape necessarily as the source of um, a duplication 
Uh, it can't be for replication, but you don't necessarily want to do it for a duplication unless you're aware of everything that will happen um, when you do that. So with NetBackup 7.6 and greater, uh, a lot of these features are available in NetBackup 7.5 for those of you that are still running 7.5. Um, but beginning in 7.6, uh, Symantec, or Veritas, as they're now being called, um, introduced uh, a scheduling feature, much like the policy schedules um, defining the backup. Uh, in 7.5, via configuration, whenever a backup would finish and it was part of an SLP, that SLP would generally kick off within 5 to 30 minutes uh, with 7.6. You can now control when you want those replication and duplication steps to happen. Uh, and you can see here that you can either uh, create a new window when you're defining the SLP, or if you already have an existing window, that was already created. You can go and select that as well. And again, this is more on uh, SLP windows. Now, we'll talk about this more uh, coming up, but we'll want to gauge um, based upon the plan that has been developed uh, when you want to uh, those images to replicate or duplicate. Um, and just like a regular net backup policy, uh, this uh, is the same uh, window. What you will notice up top, though, um, is a view impact report button. If you already have an SLP window defined, if you go to change it, uh, you can v view the impact report to see what policies um, and what implications this change will have. And that, and that is a, a nice feature if you go back and adjust schedules that have already been applied. Now with replications, um, a replication operation defines parameters uh, for a copy that's being sent to a remote master server, as we've already talked about, which is called AIR. Um, for NetBackup 7.6, you know, it will send a copy either to a specific master server, uh, which is called a targeted master when you're doing the setup, or it will send to any or all defined remote storage servers for the source pool. And we'll see that in a little bit uh, coming up. Targeting, again, is for a specific master server storage server pair. Um, and that only works when you're going to another 7.6 or higher net backup server. If you're going to a net backup 7.5, as we've just discussed, uh, you can't target it specifically. And if you do have that mixture, you'll want to make note, especially of um, which options you choose, because net backup can do a one-to-many uh, type relationship, but that may not be what you want. Uh, but that could be the effect if you choose all storage servers, which you'll see in just a little bit. Uh, so it's good to make note of, of that. Uh, as part of the setup for an SLP, you do have to define um, the storage server uh, credentials for the target storage server on the source, if that makes sense. Here you can see a screenshot. This will be um, a source master server in this case. And you can see all the different target storage servers that are defined that this disk pool can talk to uh, remotely. Also, uh, in order to create a targeted uh, setup, you have to go and create a trusted master server. Um, it is a little confusing with the names, but trusted and targeted go together when setting up an SLP. And to set up a trusted master server, what you'll do is on the source side, um, where your local copy is, You'll go into the master server's host properties to the server section, as you can see here. Go to the trusted master tab um, or trusted master servers tab and add um, the master server. Now, when you're setting this up and you click add, I don't have this in a screenshot, it'll prompt you for login credentials. And that's the login credentials to the 
to the operating system. Um, so, for example, if you are using a NIP backup appliance, you would use admin and then the admin password. If you're using a Windows remote master server, you'd use whatever um, account that you have set up remotely, but that will be a different account name password than you'll see in just a minute. Now, going back to the SLP, when we're creating the SLP, this is uh, in the properties window that you'll see here, uh, which is right next to the Windows tab. This is where you can specify that one-to-many or one-to-one -one relationship for the, um, for the storage server. In this particular case, uh, I've already selected a specific master server, selected my trusted master server from the target master server list, if that makes sense. And then what will happen when you select your trusted or your targeted master server is it will actually communicate over the MBSL process to your remote master server and pull down any SLP configuration. Now, with specific target, uh, with a specific targeted master, you have to have an SLP already created. If you do an all replication uh, option just above that, then it will auto create or auto import the SLP um, when it does its initial import. But again, when you do a, a target, it will actually talk to the remote master server. So it has to have that name resolution and authentication already set up so it can do that. And you'll see in a few minutes uh, exactly why. For AIR, a master server can be told to auto-create, which is what we were just talking about, with an import step, um, which again is for the all uh, replication targets. Uh, and an import step, when you define it on the target side, your remote master server, um, or if you let it net backup create it, you can then go back and edit it to add in what you want to do. This kind of goes back to that first uh, diagram that we had of the three different sites and what to do with the backup copies. What this particular screen is showing is the import step and plan as for the remote master server. It will import the image, and then once the image has finished importing, it will perform a duplication to tape, and then also do a replication to another site. Um, and as you can see here, uh, with the arrow under the storage section for the replication, it does not have a defined target. That's because the all target replication um, option was selected in the previous slide. Uh, we're not going to spend too much more time on, on that. Uh, we will have some more information uh, later via links that you can uh, dive into if you want to uh, set that up. But let's go on to best practices because this is, um, though there are not very many slides that I have for this, um, it will uh, be important to make sure that your SLP environment or plan is set up correctly. Um, and again, I, I can't harp on this enough, an SLP is an implementation of a plan. Make sure you have a thought out plan. Um, the worst thing that can happen is without a plan, you just start saying, you start guessing at what your backup schedule is, what your backup window is, and then start your replications and duplications without necessarily thinking through the effects of each step. And you could create an, a situation where everything just comes to a halt because things haven't been tuned or, or timed correctly. So again, make sure you have a plan as you start. And as we'll touch on in a little bit, it'll be good to go back and revisit that plan as your environment grows. Uh, SLP windows, as we've talked about already, are a great way to control when those SLPs or when those uh, secondary steps are run. 
if you're running in a 24 by 7 backup environment, you may not have a backup window that you um, – or a defined backup window that you can run your secondary steps outside of. In that case, um, again, planning is critical, but also job priorities. As, we, as I mentioned uh, in a slide uh, prior, that you can adjust the job priorities for SLPs versus the backup images. So backup images have a higher priority in the net backup scheduler than do the duplications or replication steps. Um, so that is one thing that you'll definitely want to look at um, for controlling your images if you are a 24 by 7 shop. Now, when OST devices are targeting OST devices or like um, OST devices, examples being uh, a net backup MSDP, MSDP pool to another M net backup MSDP pool or a data domain to a data domain um, or quantum to a quantum. Uh, that is where you'll get your optimization from. Uh, if you go to dissimilar devices, uh, what you'll end up doing is rehydrating that data. So you need to be aware, again, with your plan, of, of what's happening and where, because it has been seen in some environments, you know, that a step came out of order or what was expected to be out of order because it wasn't planned out very well, and you're actually rehydrating the data to send it back over the network to another device. Um, and that also goes with load balancing, which is the next uh, bullet underneath that. Um, if you're going from tape, or going to tape, make sure that you're using the same media server to do reading and writing uh, for any duplication step. Because if you're doing a load balanced, uh, and or you have a load balanced server where your storage units can access um, different media servers to access the same disk pool, you could end up with a situation where media server A is doing the reading from the disk pool and media server B is doing the writing to tape, and the only way that they are communicating at that point is over the network, and you'd be rehydrating your data if you're coming from a deduplicated um, storage device. So again, planning is key. Another best practice is to introduce SLPs gradually. Um, one, so you're not overloading the server, but two, that you can actually observe the effects and performance that you're getting. If you all of a sudden open up the dam fully, you know, with all these SLPs in your backlog to be duplicated and replicated, it may have an effect different than what you're expecting. So by opening that um, the dam gradually, to use that analogy, um, you can get a better idea of performance and rates and impact that it will have on your system. Now, if you have a small system, you know, one net backup server in one data center and another remote master server in a second data center and you're backing up, you know, a few hundred clients, uh, that may not be a big deal. But once you get into the thousands um, of clients and multiple database types and all that, um, it can be hard to get your hands around once an error does happen, if it does, rather than doing the planning up front. And again, uh, what you'll want to do is tune, and we'll cover that in just a second, but tuning is critical uh, for those exact reasons. When you set up an OST pool, and by OST, um, I'm meaning uh, any type of deduplication appliance that is supported by net backup, whether it's the uh, net backup appliances, uh, a data domain, a quantum, um, or whatever net backup currently supports, uh, they will have a setting for maximum I.O. streams. And this controls the number of read and write operations that a disk pool can handle. Now, each type of OST device has different performance characteristics, can handle different amount of connections, um, and so forth. But what you'll want to do is go and set your maximum I.O. streams for that disk pool based upon what you have and your environment. Um, by default, 
it is currently set to unlimited, and so it's it's easily it's easy to overwhelm a disk pool, and then you get wondering why all of a sudden you can't do backups or duplications or replications, and it's because the disk pool is trying to do 400 of those jobs at the same time, and it was only built for 300 or 200 or whatever uh, the case may be for your particular setup. So tuning, again, comes into play here. Um, you may want to start out small, like uh, 60 maximum I.O. streams to start off with, or 100 or 150. Watch your performance. If everything goes well, increase that and see if you to, – to get um, better performance to meet your window if you're not getting it uh, with what you started out with. And that goes right along with tuning. Uh, best thing to do is apply the KISS principle. And all I'll say is keep it simple, and I'll let you fill in the rest. Fewer large jobs are better resource-wise than many smaller jobs. Um, you can tune S uh, the SLP parameters, as you'll see in a minute or two, or in a few slides anyway, of um, how big net backup or how big of a batch job net backup will create. Now, you can't get into specifics, but you can kind of massage the environment to get the performance um, characteristics that you want. And, you'll, and again, we'll see that in a few slides. And image du duplications, make note that it could be or may take just as long or longer than the original backup took, especially with the accelerator option. Now, with the accelerator option, um, what NetBackup does is it will uh, essentially create a new full image on the media server and in the NetBackup catalog uh, where it's only doing essentially change blocks on the client. So you may have an accelerated backup that takes um, 15 minutes to run, but because it's only doing change blocks, when it actually goes to rehydrate that data to tape, you're actually doing a full image to tape if you're going to tape. So, so again, as part of your planning, if that's what you're doing, make note that image duplications may take that amount of time. While ideally SLPs are a set it and forget it um, type of setup, um, what you'll want to do is uh, use OpCenter to uh, monitor how effective that is, big, uh, that is actually operating. Is there a huge backlog? Um, is everything getting through in time? There are two such reports in OpCenter uh, that we'll see shortly. Uh, that we can use to monitor it, and there are also a few commands that you can run from the command line uh, to get into a little bit more granular type of information. And uh, another best practice is if doing tape out from an M MSDP pool, again, this goes back to what we talked about earlier, it's best to use the same media server hosting the disk pool, if it is MSDP, that you are using to write uh, to tape. Now, if you're using like a data domain um, or quantum tape out features where it's going directly from um, your OST device to tape, you may not have to plan for this, um, but with uh, an MSDP pool, um, that is something to be aware of. Um, and also, uh, a key thing here is make sure that your LAN and WAN connections can ha handle the traffic patterns. Um, if you have a one gig pipe on your media server, on your, your destination side or on your target side, and you have a 10 gig um, NIC on your uh, production side, you don't want to be sending too many jobs to overwhelm the remote side and then wonder why we're not getting the performance uh, that you're expecting and you're getting this huge backlog. Um, Again, optimization between like devices uh, will definitely help that, but it's good to be aware um, that NetBackup can use all the network that you allow it to, uh, 
to take. And again, have we mentioned tuning? Yep. And why? It's because they are important, especially as your environment grows. Like I said earlier, go back and revisit your plan um, and your tuning parameters to make sure everything uh, is running um, optimally. Now here are a few links. If you just want to write down the tech ID and doc IDs, uh, then you can go to the semantic site uh, to look for them. Um, or you can also re uh, review this presentation once it gets posted online after the event. Um, but these are, again, best practices, blueprints, and troubleshooting on uh, or regarding uh, SLPs. Okay. Now, as far as the day-to-day -day management type stuff, what do you need to do? Yeah, we have op center reports, as we'll get to in a little bit, but there are also command line options that you can do um, if there is maintenance that you need to perform, if your WAN connection is going to be down. You know, how do you go and suspend stuff, or if a particular storage server is down or a particular OST device is down, how do I go and just pause those types of replications or duplications? We'll kind of cover that here um, by covering uh, the command line options. Primarily, there are two commands that you will use uh, regarding the SLP subsystem within that backup, and that's the MBSTL util, which is in the admin command directory. And there's also the MBSTL command, uh, which is more for policy manipulation, as we'll get into in just a little bit. Uh, the MBSTL util uh, command, as you can see, has these available operations. You can uh, make up um, an SLP active. It's, if it's been deactivated, you can deactivate it. If it's, if it's active and you need to, you can cancel an SLP control on one or more sets of backup copies or images. Um, you can list. Uh, there are several different types of lists, as you can see. There's the list, there's the pending import list, um, there's the progress list, um, which all will give you different aspects of the um, SLP uh, control over the images. Um, and you can also do uh, help to get more uh, usage information after that, but we won't go into that here. As an example, if you want to see what specific backup images have not been completed on the master server, you would run the MBSTL util uh, STLI list uh, operation with a dash image underscore incomplete. The dash capital U at the end changes the format of the output as to how you see, else it's kind of all in a line and uh, it's not interpreted. Um, but here you can see that there are a few uh, images that are still in process that they have not completed. And one thing to note about this list is that it's in chronological order. So if you go back and notice, or if you discover you know, a week from now that your backlog of images is a month old and you're deciding what to keep and what not to keep in order to, to get everything caught up, uh, this is the way that you can do it. It will, um, by backup ID, or, or the timestamp in the backup ID, um, you can determine when a backup was performed uh, and make your decisions there. Uh, to display a summary report of the SLP backlog, um, this is quick, but, well, it can be quick depending upon how many SLPs you have. In this case, uh, we only have one uh, inactive SLP that has four copies that have not uh, completed. And the total expected size, I will um, note here, is that it is the, the front end size. It was what was actually um, protected. So if you're going from a deduplication, if you're going to a deduplication device for the backup step, you will not see the deduplicated size in this report. You will see the full image size uh, of what was protected. Um, and sometimes that can get kind of scary when you see that there are actually terabytes in the backlog, and that may uh, be so, but again, with deduplication going OST to like OST device, you're not actually going to be um, replicating that entire 
amount of data. Uh, but anyway, so that that is that. So what else can you do with the MBSTL util command? You can uh, deactivate or suspend an SLP um, from performing its secondary steps. Now, when you do suspend or make it inactive, uh, what you'll see in the GUI is when you um, suspend it, um, you'll see that in the SLP in the GUI. Let me rephrase it that way. Versus the MBSTL util command, which uses the word inactive. It's the same thing, um, just different phraseology uh, between the two interfaces. So here you can uh, inactivate an SLP, or you can in a, inactivate a destination, uh, and, and you can see the different options. I won't necessarily go into all the different options, um, but there are um, lots of choices based upon your need. Now, what this will do to note is it will only suspend or make inactive the secondary steps, like the GUI says. Your backup steps are considered primary, and those will always happen. So if you want to keep a backup policy from running, you would need to deactivate that in the GUI at the policy level versus using the SLP commands, which will inactivate the secondary steps so you can still perform uh, your backups with an, a suspended SLP. And you can see some examples here. Um, Now, as we mentioned earlier, uh, excuse me while well, I take a quick drink. As you can see here, um, the way to cancel an SLP is only from the command line. There is not an option yet to uh, cancel an SLP control from the GUI. And there may be many different reasons why you, you want to or need to cancel. And that can be based on maintenance or, or whatever. But these are different ways that you can uh, cancel SLP controls um, on a set or, or a set of backup images. You can either do it by backup ID, by lifecycle policy, um, by destination. If you have multiple destinations or duplication steps in your SLP and you have a storage server, one of those two storage servers is down for an extended period of time, but you already have one copy, you may want to cancel the copy going to the down storage server as an example, and you can do that uh, via this command. One thing to note, uh, as you can see at the bottom, is when you do cancel an SLP, it, um, the retention level that is defined in that policy gets applied immediately. Um, and so if an image has reached its expiration date, know that if the SLP has not completed and is canceled, that, that retention gets applied and you could have those backup images expire immediately. If you're needing to copy them or do some other uh, form of manipulation with them, <clears throat> you can either keep that backup from expiring images using the no expire touch flag or change um, the retention level um, or whatever you may need based upon your situation. Another option is uh, if you have, as an example, a down storage server with a big backlog, you may want to change the destination. Say you spin up a third um, storage server uh, to handle uh, the copies instead of um, the second one because for whatever reason the second one's not able to come back up online and you have a different name or host name or uh, location uh, for your third uh, storage server, what you will find is that when you go into the NetBackup admin console to change an SLP policy, it will actually create a new version of that SLP, which will only apply to images that are created after that change. So if you make a change today, it will not have it's not retroactive on any backlog that may exist from the uh, yesterday or the day before, or however long they're there. So you may want to go in and change the destination, and to do that, you have to do that via command line. As you can see here in this example, we have one backup image and two 
uh, duplication steps. And we want to change uh, the destination of those duplication steps as they apply to the existing backlog. Um, and to do that, we'll use the MBSTL uh, command and the MBSTL util. One, you'll want to make the lifecycle uh, inactive and also use the MBSTL command to list out uh, the existing policy. Now, there is an all versions, as you can see, or you can list out a specific version. Net Backup keeps track of every single version. And every time you go into the GUI to make a change and then get out, it creates a new version. So you may have a backlog that has 10 different versions of a single SLP if you go in and change it every day, as an example. Um, so you want to make sure you know which policy is applied, um, and you can do that by listing the, the version. So you can see here that with the modified version, uh, let me see if I can highlight that real quick. What we'll want to do is this command is a little uh, funky as it is. Uh, there we go. You'll see here that because we have three different operations that have three different storage locations, that with the MBSTL command, you have to list out all three operation or destinations for each operation in order. So I can't just tell it I want to change the destination for operation two or operation three and only put that information in. I have to put it all in um, currently. And then you can see that by making this change, we're going from the first copy is uh, on advanced disk, and then the other two are on an MSDP pool. <clears throat> And we change that version to now go to all three going to the same disk pool. Now, that's not necessarily a real-life example, <clears throat> as you would have different targets, but that does show you um, that it can be done. And we'll see that in a little bit as well. Um, so what do you do when you need to restore from an SLP? It's great that you can send your images to your data center in New York and your Saint, uh, data center in St. Louis and your data center in California. But what do you do? How do you get that back? Make note of these two tech notes. We'll cover them <clears throat> briefly here so you can see them as a first time, and then you can use these to go back and reference um, a little bit later. But you can re either restore from the remote copy, and if you do that, note, you'll probably be rehydrating the image that you're restoring. Or you can replicate back to your local data center, your local environment, and then do the restore. And when you, when you do that second option, what you're doing is you're sending the data optimized from, say, New York to St. Louis, assuming, again, they're like OST devices, so you're, that restore or that transfer is happening much faster and causing less impact on the network. So be aware of which option um, you choose, but you can choose either of those options um, to restore your images. Now, when you're restoring from a remote master server, one thing that you'll want to do is on your local client, make sure that the remote master server or remote media server is in the server list. This will either be in the vp.conf file for Unix and Linux servers or the registry for Windows. Uh, make sure your DNS or host files are correct. So the um, two div uh, devices on, in either uh, data center can communicate with each other. And again, uh, note the impact that the WAN or the restore will have on the WAN. Um, you may need extra time or you may have to do it during non-production hours versus a replication back that we'll talk about that can be done during production hours because of the impact that it has on the WAN. <clears throat> now, when you do a replication back, uh, there are several things that you'll want to do. Uh, one, you'll want to make sure that on the local side or the side that is now being the target, 
uh, that all the backup images have been um, expired. They have been cleaned up. Um, that way there's no uh, corruption when it tries to go to import the, the catalog record during the import step and it sees that the backup image is already there, uh, it may have problems and <clears throat> you'll just need to make sure that that is cleaned up. Also, when you defined, um, as we defined the credentials at, uh, at the beginning of the uh, presentation on the storage server, you'll want to make sure that the credentials um, go both ways and both directions here. Um, you can set it up for just one, but in order to do a remote back, the, me the host media server will need to access the now target uh, storage pool. So those credentials have to be set up. And then you'll use the MB replicate command um, to ac actually perform that transfer rather than using it through the GUI. Uh, which currently is not an option. Uh, a couple of things that you'll want to note here, uh, and I'll highlight here, is that for the remote copy number, you want to add 101 uh, to that value. So if you have copy 1 on your remote server, then the copy number here uh, that you'll be creating will be 102. Or if you have 2, you know, it'll be 103 and likewise. Uh, that's just a particular requirement for how uh, this was uh, coded. Um, I will also note that the SLP name here can be anything you want. In this example, and the example that Symantec has uh, in their notes is reverse error, so you know that that SLP was used for that particular purpose, but it doesn't have to be defined um, beforehand, and it can be anything uh, that may be more meaningful to you. And then you do have to fill out the rest of the information here. Uh, as I mentioned, when setting up the credentials that you're using or a targeted uh, or trusted master server, that you're using the, the login credentials for the media server, uh, since we're dealing with the disk pool here, um, this will be the, the credentials for the disk pool itself. For a net backup appliance, um, the username will be root, and the appliance uh, password uh, for the disk pool itself, not the admin password um, or the root password, but the MSDP password, is available via the clish um, through the command that you see there. For non-MSDP pools or non-appliance MSDP pools, um, it'll be whatever you defined when you created the disk pool. So it's always good to remember those credentials, have them stored either in your um, credential um, software or preferably not written down, but somewhere available um, that you can go and reference it or that someone else can reference it in a month or two months or whenever the change needs to be done. And this is an example. You can see here at the top um, where I expired a particular backup image on uh, MBAP03, and it's no longer there. And then on my remote server, uh, you can see the image is being listed there. Uh, fill out the MB replicate command based upon um, the parameters it needs. And uh, this, uh, actually that didn't highlight, hang on. This will be specific. Uh, that's not highlighting very well. <clears throat> Anyway, the target password, again, is um, specific to each disk pool. And then once the replication has finished, you will see a job in the activity monitor on the um, source side, current source side, which is this, uh, which is, again, that's not highlighting very well. Let's see if I can do that. No. Anyway, on the... Um, MSPD 5200 uh, server, uh, there will be a job in the activity monitor, but you can also see um, a little details uh, at the command line, uh, though not as much as you'll see in the GUI. And then once the transfer has been completed, before it's been imported, uh, you'll see that in the MBSTL util pinned import list that there is something for that disk pool to do. 
And then here you can see, again, once it does get imported, um, you'll then be able to restore. Let's cover reporting. I'll kind of go through this rather quick, and then we can get on to tuning and troubleshooting, as I know we're um, starting to run out of time. This will actually be fairly uh, quick to go through. With Ops Center, there are two types of reports. There's the SLP status and the SLP backlog. Ops Center comes free. With Net Backup, there is an Ops Center analytics um, option that is a cost item if you're using a traditional license or um, comes with the capacity license. Anyway, these are the two different types of reports that you can um, generate with Ops Center, and this is a sample uh, of them. And if you notice, all the blue numbers are uh, hyperlinked. So you can click on those uh, non-zero ones anyway and dive in to get more granular. Um, and then you can also do a chart um, showing you the backlog, what has been transferred, what has been created, um, and, and such. And these reports can be um, emailed because they are an op center. You can create a schedule um, for reports. So if you want to set, say email your report, you come in at seven and you want to find out what it is. Uh, you can have op center email you the reports at seven or eight, or send them to somewhere else to uh, your manager or whoever wants to see them. That can be done all through op center. But those are the two reports uh, that are available. Now with tuning. Um, this is essentially the options that you have that you are given um, by NetBackup. And these are in the master server's host property section. At the bottom of the list is SLP parameters. And again, we're not going to cover all of them, but know that you can come into here and change. For example, we were talking about fewer batch jobs um, versus small, a larger quantity of smaller jobs. You can come in here and make that change by setting the um, maximum size per duplication job, uh, which by default is 100 gig. Um, but you may want to make that a terabyte or two terabytes uh, to get the batch size that you want. You can't necessarily tell NetBackup, I only want to do one image or five images or this particular server in this particular job. Um, but what you can do is massage these parameters that you see now um, to get the effect that you want. Um, you can see here also are the job submission intervals. Um, that's how often the MBSTL subsystem will check for a job, um, how often it will import. Uh, if uh, we did talk about the auto create uh, earlier, and let's see if I can highlight that on this. Yeah, there we go. Um, by default, now that is set to yes, um, but you could set that to no for some reason. Um, but we were talking about that earlier, and that's where this setting is defined. So as an example, if you are not getting the SLPs created on the target side like you were expecting, you want to go in here to see if that setting is set to yes or not on the target side. Now, parameters are site-specific um, or master server-specific, so changes that you make on your master server in New York won't have won't affect the um, images on the master server in St. Louis or California or wherever your data centers may be. Um, so note that you may have to adjust these at each site accordingly, but this is where you would do it. In addition to those, tape and disk buffer um, settings should also be revisited because those do have an impact on the transfer rates. Um, you may not need to change them, but it's a good opportunity to go back and see, am I getting the performance that I am expecting? And if not, we may need to adjust these uh, parameters. And as I mentioned earlier, NetBackup is one of the best applications to test your network configuration. Um, it will use everything that you allow it to use. Um, so if performance is not as expected, um, make sure um, that the network path is tuned as expected. Um, 
if you have a net backup appliance. There is a WAN optimization feature if you're talking appliance to appliance. And what that does is it, it adds a TCP fast kernel module uh, into the appliance's kernel uh, to better handle that WAN optimization. You may want to have that on, you may want to have that off, but you will want to test um, either way the effects of having it on or off. And uh, finally, with this, uh, with many WAN configurations today, there are multiple routers and packet shapers along the, the data path. These can have an impact, um, positive or negative, on the success and performance of the SLP jobs. Um, so if there is an issue, it may be within the net backup environment or it may be great or outside of that environment, but know that net backup will stress test or can stress test if not properly tuned um, your network, <clears throat> which may or may, may not make your network administrators happy. Um, and then we'll cover troubleshooting real quick. <clears throat> I know this is something that you'll, you'll want to dive into more um, and we, should, we may want to spend more time on, but this again is to get an overview to let you see what's going on within the SLP system. <clears throat> to know where the, the debug logs are, uh, and then as, as needed, um, if an issue does arise, then how do we get that information out? Now, I did not create this um, chart. This came from the SLP uh, blueprint that was um, created by Symantec, av available at the link that you see. Uh, the, S the MBST serve is the primary process um, that drives the SLP um, subsystem, and it's composed of two components, really. Um, you can see the SLP manager and the service, and that will handle import, but you can see the interaction to all the other components within Net Backup, um, whether it be the BPDBM, the BP Job, um, the scheduler, um, or the MBDB database, which is the MBEMM. Uh, you can see that interaction here, and based upon what type of um, issue you're having will um, affect what log, and this kind of gives you an idea of um, which logs may be needed. Typically, though, the MBST serve, MBST serve yeah, log will have what you need, as well as the BPTM and BPDM logs, um, and those are always uh, the go-to logs uh, when starting the debug process. Um, the MBST serve is a unified log whether versus the um, BPTM and BPDM logs being the traditional uh, net, back, net backup debug logs. Um, so you'll use the VX log CFG and the VX log view commands to change the, um, the, the verbose settings and to view the logs. Uh, for the MBST serve, and then you'll use your uh, regular um, verbose settings in the Net Backup Admin GUI or the BP.conf uh, for the BPTM and BPDM. And also, um, when you're dealing with replication devices, you'll want to um, pull those logs, whether it be an MSDP pool or data domain, or quantum, or whatever is supported, you may need to go to those logs to find out what is happening again. Um, with MSDP pool, uh, you can see here the paths uh, to the replication logs, the, and this will be on the source side. The, the source pool, or the, the SPA-D on the source pool, will have uh, a replication log that will show um, how many streams it's running, which is different than the number of net backup jobs you may see. Um, performance, is there bandwidth throttling? That type of information will be found in the replication.log, uh, as well as the session logs, which are specific to each uh, stream, whether it's coming in or going out uh, of the storage pool. Now, several things that you'll see on the GUI side or in the job side with SLPs when there is an issue, 
is that you may see a 191. A status 191 means that particular job was not able to transfer any of the images that was created for that particular batch. Um, a status 1 indicates that one or more images did work, but one or more images did fail. And so unlike a status 1 in a regular backup job where it may be because a file was open and you don't care, you'll want to go back and look at the status ones if you do encounter them in your environment uh, with the SLP jobs. Um, and as we talked about earlier with the MBSTL util inactive, to do that from the GUI, you come and select the suspend secondary operations um, here, which you may need to do while troubleshooting uh, to keep Net backup from continually processing because Net backup will continue to process until it's told to stop, cancel, or is complete. Um, so um, suspending may may be necessary, uh, which you'll want to uh, to be aware of. Um, that if you suspend on one day and then the next day you're wondering why is now that you've got everything fixed, why is it not working, it may be because it was still suspended and you need to go back and reactivate it. Um, and so here are some links to remember. Uh, you may want to screenshot these or, again, go back to the presentation um, afterwards once it is posted online. Uh, and uh, this is a good um, – or a good set of list or links to have in your library, again, for whatever issue you may have. Uh, the bottom is a cheat sheet. It's a little old um, now, but it does have a, a list of all the commands and options. So that would be a good one um, to print out or have handy uh, in your web browser, uh, just so you can go back and, and review those fairly quickly rather than having to dive through the admin guide uh, to figure out the command or, or whatnot. Um, so uh, now that we've uh, reached the end, um, you know, what have we talked about? Have we talked about what an SLP is? Yeah, it's an implementation of your plan. And again, a plan is critical. Uh, without a plan, it can have an adverse effect as things begin to grow and, and get out of hand. How do you configure it? We've covered that. Uh, best practices, we've touched on that. And you can see we've actually touched on on each one of these. Um, but again, the SLP subsystem is a way to manage your backup images, their locations, and their retentions to meet uh, your company's plans, whether it be for um, uh, you have some kind of like HIPAA requirement or what other kind of uh, requirements you might have. This is the way uh, to make sure that you have the data where you need it, when you need it, and as well as how to get it back when you have to do a restore. So I know we're out of time, and that's all I have. Um, so Kirsten, I don't know if there's any other wrap-ups that you want to do. Uh, no, unless um, I think all the questions so far have been answered that came in through Q&A, so I think we are good on that front. Okay, and if you do have any other questions, I believe there's a um, Tech Tuesday alias that you can email questions into, um, or feel free to give us a call um, for the um, uh, via our 800 number. Um, and with that, I'm done. Yep, and just in case anyone does want to go back, this will, you'll need to give us a couple days to get this posted online, but it will be out on datalink.com. And if you go under Resources and Library, there's a Tech Tuesday link, and it'll live right out there. So you can go and look at the archives, and probably, probably about three days will be posted. So with that, thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon.